Well, good morning, church. Oh, surely we can do a bit better than that. Good morning, church. Hey, there we go. A bit of life in the house of God is always a good thing. I hope you're doing well. Great. Are you guys ready for the word? Amazing. <clears throat> Amazing. Special greetings also to you if you're in the city campus or if you're watching us online. Welcome to you. We're glad that you can join us. We're about to head into uh, our message for this morning. And if you're ready, um, I just want to give you a little bit of a, a preemptive warning that today's text can be quite heavy. Uh, it is quite a low point in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is the book that we've been exploring as a church and going through. Uh, the teacher is exploring the meaning of life, and he's reaching this point where um, he's actually getting quite depressed. And so we're going to read that passage, um, and we're going to hope that God can speak. We know that God can speak, that even in um, his sad reflections on a lot of things, there's truth to be found, and there's hope to be found in God. Amen? Amen. So before we start, let's, let's pray, let's commit this time to God, and then let's get going. Heavenly Father, we just submit this moment into your hands. Lord, we ask that you would come and speak through your word. Holy Spirit, would you come and minister life to your people? Would you come and show us the beauty of the name of Jesus? Would you help us to fall more in love with you? And would you reveal yourself to us in this word today? Lord, we thank you that every time we open your word, it's a chance for us to hear the very voice of God as you speak to us. So Lord, speak to us. We are listening, we are available, and we are eager. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. <clears throat> amen. Well, church, if you have been following along this series, you know that King Solomon, the teacher, is exploring the meaning of life, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, he's looking at life from all different perspectives, whether that's work, whether that's pleasure, whether that's time. And today, the teacher turns his attention towards people. He begins to observe people. He looks at how they live, he looks at how they deal with one another, and he comes down to a very sad conclusion, which is that people treat each other very badly. People treat each other horribly, and life can be unfair sometimes. Does anyone resonate with that? Life can sometimes feel unfair. And as he reflects on this, his thoughts get more and more depressing, more and more sad, and that's where this picks up in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We're going to be reading from verse 16. So if you've got your Bibles, you can join me. The scripture's also up on the screen. Let's read it. It says, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. And I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upwards, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. And so I saw there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? And in chapter four, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun and behold, the tears of the oppressed and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors, there was power and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead who are already dead are more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and who has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. He's a bundle of sunshine, isn't he? Everyone feeling happy? Everyone feeling joyful after that reading? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna look at this passage and we have to understand that the wise man is making observations about how life is for people with the limitations, like Pastor Benny has mentioned in previous weeks, of under the sun as long as I live. So he is looking at life from uh, the, the perspective of a person who has no sense of God in their life. That when you look at injustice, when you look at oppression, when you look at the way people treat each other, these are the conclusions that you will naturally come to. 
And to be honest, as you were reading through this passage this morning, you would probably have heard some of these thoughts come up um, when you talk to people who live without God, who don't believe in God. When you ask them, what's the meaning of life? What, what do you want to do with your life? A lot of the times, the conclusions come down to the same conclusions that the wise man makes, isn't it? You know, no one knows what happens after we die. Who knows um, if we have a life after death? No one can prove it. No one can know it. So why don't you just live your life? Do what you want to do. Enjoy your life. That is your lot. That's all there is to it. That's all there is to the meaning of life. Have you heard that argument before? And so the wise man is making these observations. And so I'm going to unpack these observations for us. And hopefully, we're going to see whether his response to them, to these observations, whether his conclusions that he makes out of them um, can apply to our lives today and how they can be redeemed in light of who we are as people who have God with us. Amen? Amen. Okay, so here's the first observation that I would like to outline for you. The King Solomon first notices that in the places where you would expect right judgment and righteousness, he notices that he finds wickedness instead. That where there should be righteousness and justice, he finds wickedness. You know, isn't that true for even today in our world, in our society today? You know, the internet is full of videos of injustice. Whether you wanna search up law enforcement overstepping their jurisdiction, a person being arrested without due process, being violated and abused, whether in court, guilty criminals are let off due to technical, uh, legal technicalities or corruption, whether innocent people are wrongly incarcerated and serve time in jail because they couldn't afford the means to defend themselves in court. You know, government officials are being given positions um, depending on where you're at in the world based on shady reasons and entire nations are subject to the oppressive regimes and political systems that they're involved in. Even in the history of the church, the Catholic church, there have been reported cases of priests who commit sexual abuse with minors and their parishioners. You know, there is a great feeling of injustice when the places which are expected to uphold righteousness, to uphold good judgment, end up using that power in the wrong way. Can anyone agree with me? Do you see that in the world today? People with power, the people, the places where we expect righteousness and judgment, we find wickedness instead. You know, the problem, the problem is not actually with authority. The problem is not actually even with these places. It's not with leaders. It's not with uh, political governors. It's not with um, churches and, and their priests. The problem is with people. The problem is with people, sinful, broken people. Because let's be honest, when you take someone who is imperfect, who is sinful and broken, and you give that person leadership and power and authority, how foolish would it be of us to expect that that person is going to wield that power perfectly, right? Sinful, broken people do sinful, broken things. Authority and power simply amplifies and magnifies who we are on the inside. And that is the problem that we're seeing today. You know, take even uh, the presidential debate that aired this week. I don't know how many of you guys have watched it. But you would expect that at the highest levels of office, the leaders of the free world would exemplify the highest levels of leadership, of character, of righteousness, and of good judgment, amen? That's what you would expect. But if you watched it, you would notice the same thing that the wise man is seeing here. In the places where you would expect those things, we find sinful, broken people doing sinful, broken things. And so that is what the wise man is observing. It is not just a problem in his time, but it's a problem in our time as well. And that's why injustice is an unsolvable problem. It's an unsolvable problem until Jesus comes again and he establishes his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Because as long as people exist, as long as people are sinful, there will be injustice. Do you agree? As long as broken people are in this world, there will be 
injustice. It will keep being a problem that rears its ugly head over and over again. And this is what King Solomon noticed, that in the places where righteousness and justice should prevail, wickedness is found instead. Here's the second observation that he makes. He notices and he says, people are like animals. That's his observation. People are no better off than beasts. Death awaits us all. He observes that death is the great equalizer. There's nothing that we can do to escape it. Whether you live a moral life or an immoral life, whether you are wise or foolish, rich or poor, smart or not, we all die just like the animals. Verse 20, it says, from dust we came and to dust we return. Who knows what happens after we die? As far as we can see and as far as we can assume with our limited under the sun understanding, death is the end. And if that's the case, then people and animals are just the same. All of it is meaningless. And you're gonna, like I mentioned earlier, you're gonna hear that same kind of observation and argument from people who don't uh, yet know the Lord, who don't have God in their life. You know, death is the great leveler. It awaits us all. So life, purpose, it's meaningless. Why live morally? Why just do what you want, be happy, live your life the best way that you know how. And here's the third observation. His ob third observation is this. The oppressed have no comfort from their oppressors. You know, the third thing that he finds is that those who are oppressed have no comfort from their oppressors. Those who are in power use that power to keep their positions, while those who are oppressed have very little ability to change their position in life. You know, the Bible records of all different kinds of oppressions. Kings oppress their people. Masters oppress their servants and their slaves. The rich exploit the poor. They give them high interest rates and impossible loans. The foreigner, the orphan, and the widow are all mistreated and neglected. In short, what King Solomon is observing is simply this. He's looking around and he's observing that life is just not fair. It's just not fair. And it led him to three different conclusions. Now we have to remember, I'm gonna unpack these conclusions, these responses that he has to these observations. And we have to remember that again, he is looking at life from under the sun as long as I live within the limited temporal scope of his lifetime. Very, he's not looking at God very much. He's not looking beyond that. He's not looking at eternity. He's just looking at life um, under the sun. And so these are his conclusions, all right? His first conclusion is this. When he saw that there's wickedness instead of righteousness and justice, his conclusion is this. God will judge everything in his time. God will judge everything in his time. And so for a brief moment, this is the only happy moment in the sermon. So just heads up. <laughs> The only happy moment in this passage is for this very brief moment where the teacher snaps out of his depressing under the sun thinking and he trusts God to be the final judge. Where sinful people and broken systems were unable to judge righteously, King Solomon believed that God would judge righteously in the end. Verse 17, he says, I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked for there is a time for every matter and for every work. And Solomon was right. Come on, church, did you know that we serve a God who is the great judge? He is the great judge. The Bible says that there will be a day where every person has to stand before God and give an account for their life. For every action, for every word, whether good or evil, they will have to give an account before God. You know, Revelation chapter 20 talks about this from verse 11. Let me just read it for you. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So the Bible talks about God being the final and great judge. It's not something we like to talk about nowadays. Most often we talk about Jesus, 
being the loving savior, the one who comes near to us, the one who shows us grace and forgiveness and love and life, but part of who our God is. Because he is the almighty God, he is also the great judge. Humans in their imperfection, in their brokenness, will judge wrongly because that is who we are. But God is a just judge. He cannot be corrupted. He will not be swayed with smooth words or legal technicalities. He sees everything just as it is and he will judge it perfectly. Now, this is a great comfort. This is a great comfort for for us um, and it's a great comfort for anyone who is going through injustice because we know that even when we are going through situations that are not fair, even when uh, we are going through injustices in our life, we can trust that God sees, He knows, and in the end, He is in control. Everything has to be judged by God in the end. Nothing escapes His sight. And what that means for us, if we believe that, and if we believe that God is the good and final judge of all things, that it means that we don't need to be the judge of our own situations. That when injustice happens to us, we don't need to fight it. We don't need to uh, war for our own rights. It frees us up so that God can win on our behalf. Even if we don't see justice, even if we don't see what's fair in this lifetime, we can trust that we serve a God who will bring justice on our behalf. And even more than that, even more than that, it frees us, it, just, it doesn't just free us up so that we can let go when injustice happens to us, but it helps us to be at peace with those who hurt us and even bless them. Romans 12 talks about it. It says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, now listen to this. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Are you getting that, church? The key to being able to live a life that that succeeds and flourishes, even when life is unfair, even when we go through the injustices of things that happens to us, is the theological anchor that we are don't need to be the final judge. Our God is just, vengeance is his, he will repay. We can entrust anything that happens to us into his hands, amen? And that's amazing, that's amazing because when people treat you unfairly, there's no need for us to to fight anymore. There's no need for us to hold on to what we think we deserve. We don't need to make sure that justice is served on our behalf. We can do so much more than just let it go, but we can actually overcome evil with good. We can overcome evil with good. And church, that is the kind of people that we are called to be. We are called to be the kinds of people who are not fighting for our own rights, but who are overcoming evil with good. When people hurt us, when people do things that we don't like, when people treat us unfairly, we are called to love, to give forgiveness, and to bless in return. And that is only possible because we know that God is the great and final judge. Is that cool? Cool, here's the second observation or the second second response that he makes. So his, his observation is that he saw that death is the great leveler, right? We're all like animals. And his conclusion is this, just enjoy life while you can. Life is short, death awaits us all. It doesn't matter how you live your life. At the end of the day, you can't escape the inevitability of death. And so, Just enjoy your life while you can. Verse 22, I saw there's nothing better than the man should rejoice in his work for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Now this is the very same conclusion that many people reach even nowadays. It's especially common amongst those who believe that this life is all that there is. You know, eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. Have you heard that before? You know, it's the natural conclusion for those who view life as here and now, for those who view life without a sense of God and without a sense of eternity in their hearts. And it makes sense because if this life is really all that there is, why not just live your best life? If this life is all that there is, 
If these few years on earth is all that you have, why not just do whatever makes you happy? It makes a lot of sense. There is a wisdom in that. But we have to remember that there were things that the wise man didn't take into account. Because when he reached this conclusion, when he said, okay, we're all just the same as animals, there were some things in his observations, in the things that he saw and believed that we need to correct and tweak according to the counsel of God's word. For example, let me, let me point out some few things to you. In verse 20, he says, and he's talking about uh, animals and man, and he says, look, they all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. You know, King Solomon saw that animals and mankind had the same breath. The Hebrew word used here is the, is the word ruach. It means spirit. Animals and man, humans and beasts all have the same spirit. But if you read back to the creation account in Genesis, you will quickly find that there is something wrong there. You realize that the teacher had it wrong. Because when God made the heavens and the earth, when he made the animals in the, in the air, he made the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, right? He spoke them into being, did he not? Do you remember in Genesis chapter one? You know, every time you start your new Bible reading plan, everyone starts from Genesis and hopes that they'll finish the Bible. So Genesis chapter one is probably one of the most often read pieces of scripture. But if you, if you go back to that account, you remember that God spoke and things came into being. He said, let there be light. And there was light, right? Let the land produce animals, uh, each of its own kind, and it came to pass. Let the seas be full of uh, swimming creatures, teeming with life and all that kind of stuff, and it happened. But what happened when he came and he made man? What happened when he made people? Everything else in creation, he spoke and it came to be, but everything except mankind. Genesis chapter two, verse seven. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Now that's actually amazing. It's amazing because it shows that from the very beginning, he didn't just speak us into existence, he formed us. Everything else he spoke, the mountains, the galaxies, the stars, sun, moon, the light, Everything that we know was spoken into existence, but we as mankind, as people, were formed by God. The, the word formed here has the picture of a potter who is molding and shaping clay. God was hands-on. He was close to us as he made us. God, even from the very beginning, has come closer to mankind than anything else in all creation. From the very beginning. Isn't that amazing? We have a special place in his heart. He was not giving instructions from afar. He was not, let there be man and it should be all good. But he came close. He formed us off the dust of the ground. And not only did he do that, but he breathed into us. And man became a living soul. Not only did he form us, he breathed into us the breath of life. He didn't do it for fish. He didn't do it for cows or for chickens. He didn't do it for whales or for elephants, but God breathed into people like you and me. He chose to make people in his image. That's why, oh, let me read, read you that verse, Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make mankind or people in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. God breathed into us so that we might relate to him in a way that nothing else in creation can. I want you to catch that for a moment because everything is declaring the praises of our God. Whether they like it or not, they are declaring and witnessing to the glory of God. When you look at creation, everything witnesses to the glory of God. But there is a special place for mankind where we are called to relate to God in a way that nothing else on this earth can. We are not the same as animals. We are not just beasts. We are called to live with special relationship with our creator. And what the teacher fails to recognize that is that people are not at all like animals. We don't just share the same breath. We are not made in the same image. And we do not just return to the dust 
when we die. Right? <laughs> we don't just return to the dust when we die. Jesus Christ did not come and die on the cross to save your goldfish. But he went to the cross and he died because he loved people and he knew that our eternal destinies were at stake. If this life is all there is to it, then Jesus Christ need not come. After all, we enter into oblivion at the end of our life and that's all there is to it. We don't need to worry about anything, but our eternal destinies were at stake and that is why Jesus Christ had to come. We were destined for destruction. We were trapped in our sin. There was nothing that we could do. We were separated from God and that's why Jesus Christ had to come and restore us back to himself. Our, in, our intended purpose from creation to especially have this special relationship with God needed to be restored. And so he came and he paid the penalty for our sin so that our eternal destiny could be changed from darkness into light, from death into life. And now you and I can be restored to our original purpose to have right relationship with God. You and I are very different from beasts. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Don't let anybody try to convince you that this life is all there is. You're just like an animal. Do whatever an animal does, whatever it wants, and just live your life. And now that we know, now that we know that we're different from the animals, now that we know that we were God breathed, now that we know that God specially formed us and breathed into us, that we were created for life eternally with God, it is no longer sufficient to live our lives in a way which is just about enjoying life. It is no longer sufficient for us to echo the slogan, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. We were created for something more than that. It's falling far short of what you and I were created for if we settle for that kind of life. Church, can I, can I say this? You and I were created especially for a relationship with God. So pursue that. Prioritize it over everything that you do. This is what gives our life meaning and purpose that we can have relationship with our creator. Are you, are you getting that, church? Prioritize it, pursue it. Don't let anything distract you from it. Everyone is trying to find fulfillment and meaning in everything else, whether that be in holidays, good luck with that right now, whether that be with food, whether that be with pleasures, whether it be with career progression, power, finances, buying the boat, living the life, doing whatever that they want to do. Everyone is pursuing that dream, but none of that can give you meaning. Only life with God can give you meaning because that was your original intended purpose. That is what you and I were created for. We are different than the beasts. You know, the teacher, he, King Solomon, he explored all possible options to try and find meaning in his life. And his conclusion was always the same. It's like, it is all meaningless, it's all vanity, it's all like smoke. It's here one second, it's gone the next. You know, King Solomon, he had everything that anyone ever could ask for. He had riches, he had power, he had women, he had enjoyment and pleasures, he could do whatever he wanted, he had wisdom, he was a smart guy. And at the very end of it all, he realized that nothing could satisfy him because the truth is that life without God is meaningless. Life without God is meaningless, but life with God is infinitely meaningful. So church, can I encourage you? Don't just settle for a life of eating and drinking and being merry. Don't settle for that subpar life. Let's pursue life with God. Pursue life with God and allow him to take us on the adventure that he created us for. Amen? Amen. So that was the, the second conclusion that King Solomon came to, which we needed to update and revise with the gospel. Is that okay? The third one is this. When he saw that the oppressed had no comfort from their oppressors, he reaches a, a new low and he concludes, you know what? It's just better to die than live. Sunshine and rainbows. Verse two of chapter four says this, I thought the dead who are already dead are more fortunate than the living who are still alive. 
but better than both is he who has not yet been and who has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. He reaches an all-time low. He looks around, he sees injustice, he sees oppression, he sees that there are things that are not going away quickly. He sees that life is unfair and his conclusion is simply that it is better to die than to live and even better to never have been born in the first place. It doesn't sound like a very fun person to be around, does he? You know, but again, we see that there are things that King Solomon hasn't taken into account in reaching his conclusion because he's looking around and he's seeing that there's no one to comfort the oppressed twice. He says this twice. And perhaps it's true when you look around and you look at life without God. When you look at the state of injustice in the world today, when you see what's happening in the streets, when you look at protests and riots and racism and poverty, when you look at the injustice that happens around the world and you have no semblance of God in your heart, that conclusion is actually not that far off. That, you know what? It's just not worth, life sometimes is just not worth living. When you look at someone who is stuck in poverty or stuck under a, an oppressive regime and they can't escape and their life, the quality of life is so affected by that and they have no sense of comfort from anything eternal. The conclusion that, you know what? They have no comfort. Maybe life is, it's better to die than live. Maybe it's better not to have even been born. But once we elevate our perspective, we are reminded, we are reminded that God is the great comforter. He is the great judge, but he is also the great comforter. You know, in fact, one of the titles that is given to the Holy Spirit is the title, the comforter. It is what he does. Psalms 34, 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. Matthew 5, verse four says, blessed are those who mourn. This is what Jesus says for they will be comforted. You know, God is our comfort. He is the one who endured the greatest injustice and yet he is our greatest comfort. It is what makes him our greatest comfort. That when we go through oppression, when we see things that are unjust happening around us and to us, we know that we served a God who relates. He relates. He went through the greatest injustice. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. When Jesus Christ came to earth, you have to think about it. The God of all creation subject himself to those he created for his own glory. And in, rather than giving him the glory that he was due for creating them and giving them life, they ridiculed him, they mocked him, they scorned him and they crucified him. Our God knows injustice like none of us ever do. There's nothing on this earth that can, can compare to that injustice. And as a result of him going through that injustice, we have now become beneficiaries. You and I have eternal life, we have forgiveness, we have relationship restored with God. And as those who have now benefited from the injustice that Christ suffered, not only is he our comfort, but now we, as those who have benefited, are called to be that same comfort for those around us. You and I are called to be ministers of reconciliation. That's what the Bible says. We bring the same comfort we, that we received to those around us. Just as Jesus Christ took on the injustice of the world upon himself for our sake, you and I are now called. You and I are now called to, to take on the injustice of others for their sake. Second Corinthians chapter 1 says this, verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Now Isaiah chapter one, verse 17 says this. He says, learn to do right, to seek justice, to defend the oppressed, to take up the cause of the fatherless, to plead the case of the widow. You know, for those of us who are believers, this becomes now our response. Whenever we see oppression, whenever we see injustice, we don't simply point people to God, the great comforter, even though he is, but we are called to be his hands and feet, to bring comfort to those who need it around us. We're not called to be passive, 
We're not called to just case era, sera, whatever happens, whatever will be, will be. Let it happen. Injustice will always be a part of our world. But we are now called to go into the world and bring the comfort that we have received to those around us. Amen? Now, let me break this down for us in a way which can be a little bit more practical. Because we don't all need to now go and become involved in social justice initiatives. That is not uh, all of our callings. That may be some of us. You know, some of us are called to do national level things. We're called to address poverty. We're called to change things in our city, in our nation. Uh, maybe we're called to be some, something like an Abraham Lincoln and abolish slavery in our time, to, to address an injustice in our time. And some of us may be called to do those high level kinds of things. And if that's your call and that's your passion, you should go ahead and do that with all your heart. But all of us, all of us here, whether or not those high level things are your calling or not, all of us are called to affect change on a small scale. We can do things on a small scale. And these smaller things are often overlooked. You know, can we treat our families with the respect and the honor that they're due, even when we're not being treated fairly in our own eyes? Young people, when you relate to your parents and they are being more harsh on you than you think you deserve, when they are taking away certain privileges, getting you to study, making you do things that you don't want to do, can you still treat your parents with honor and respect when you feel like you're being treated unfairly? You can be someone who brings justice into unjust situations. Can you do something like sponsor a compassion child? That in one small way is bringing justice to places where there is none. Can we look out for one another in our connect groups? You know, maybe offer a helping hand to someone who is doing it tough or going through a tough circumstance. Maybe host a meal or, or cook dinner for someone who um, has maybe just lost their job during the season of COVID. Can we do that? That in itself, again, is bringing justice to unjust situations. You know, if you're in the workplace, can you be an upright leader and manager? You know, not all leaders need to be jerks. <laughs> but that seems to be the, the framework of the, um, the world nowadays, that in order for you to be successful, in order for you to be a great leader, you need to be very hard on everybody. You need to expect much and push people really hard and, and come down hard on them when they're not doing their jobs. But can you be a just leader? Can you be a just manager in the workplace? Can you make sure that those you have been given leadership over are well taken care of? Can we lift up the people around us, those who are always being overlooked, who are always being ridiculed and shamed, for those who are, uh, who are going through tough times, can we lift them up and look out for them? You know, if we can be faithful with the little things, then perhaps over time, some of the big things that are happening in our world today can begin to change too. But can I encourage you, church, that we don't always need to look at the big picture things. Can I encourage you that you be faithful with the little that you have been given control over? Make sure that you pursue justice in those areas, that you take care of those around you. And over time, we will see that the big things begin to change too. But whatever the case may be, God's desire is for his church that we would be salt and light, amen? Amen? You know, as we wrap up today, we've kind of explored the wise man's view and his observations and his conclusions that come from looking at a life that is unfair and unjust. And at the end of the day, we are called to look towards a God who is the personification of justice. He is the one who has everything in his, hand, in his hands. He is in control. He will make everything right in its time. But right now, I would be doing you a disservice talking about a just judge, a just God, if I didn't give you an opportunity to get right with God today. You know, it's comforting to us when we know that God will judge things righteously in the end when we face oppression, right? That someone will fight on our behalf. That's comforting, but it's also terrifying because that same just judge is gonna be the one who judges us. And you and I need to know that we are guilty in his eyes. That if we just go through our life, we are guilty in the eyes of the one who will judge all things righteously. You know, a lot of us are not scared of 
uh, judgment day. We're not terrified of this judge. Oftentimes because we view the exam wrongly. <laughs> you know, a lot of us, what we view judgment like is we think that God uh, treats it like an exam. It's a 50% pass mark. He takes all our, all our wrongdoing and he takes all of our good deeds and he weighs them against one another. And as long as we're kind of more of a good person than a bad person, we deceive ourselves into thinking, you know what, God will, God will see that and God will judge that and he'll know that I'm a good person. But the thing is, our judgment is not like an exam. It's more like a court of law. You know, when a criminal comes into a court of law, the judge doesn't take into account all the good things that that person has done in their life. He just looks at the crime. Because for a judge, for justice to happen, the crime must be paid for. It doesn't matter if a person has looked after the poor their whole life, has lived a great, generous life, taking care of everyone around them, loving their family and doing that. If they have murdered a person, they must be brought into account for their crime, right? And so in that judge's eyes, that person is gonna be guilty. That person is gonna be deserving of whatever punishment that that crime deserves. And that is how God will judge us too. That when we stand before Him and we give an account for our lives, you and I, He will judge us for everything that we did, for every lie that we told, everything that we stole, every word that we said in vain. And for Him to be just, for Him to be perfectly righteous, He will have to cause us and say that we, that the punishment that is due upon us for our sin has to come upon us. And that's the predicament that you and I are in without Him. Because regardless of whether you like it or not, all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have missed the mark. We are all imperfect. And so when we stand before God on Judgment Day, the verdict will not be good if we do not have Him. But He offers us a way out. That's the good news of the Gospel Church. He offers us a way out. He is a just and righteous God. That is who He is. He cannot let sin slide. He cannot let wrongdoing and evil go unpunished. But here's the good news, that He took all the, all the punishment that was due for every sin, for every evil, for every wrongdoing, and instead of laying it upon you, He laid it upon His Son. He declared you guilty and then sent His Son to take the punishment in your place. He sent His Son 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Creator of the world, the Word at the very beginning, sent His Son to this earth to be mocked, ridiculed, and scorned by His creation, crucified on a cross, went through a death that He didn't deserve so that you and I can be free of the punishment that was due us and can be called the righteousness of God in Him. And so I just wanna give an invitation right now to any of you who are in this place and you need to get right with God because our God is a just judge. He offers you this lifeline. He offers us the lifeline of His Son that whosoever shall believe in Him and what He did on the cross, shall be saved. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, we shall be saved. And so today, I wanna to extend the invitation to anyone here who has not yet been made right with God, who does not yet believe in the cross and what Jesus Christ has done for us. You have an opportunity right now to be judged righteous in the sight of a just and holy God who must punish evil and wrongdoing. And so right now with all eyes closed and all heads bowed, I just wanna give that opportunity. This is the most important decision that you can ever make in your life. The most important thing that you can do. And God is calling out to you today. He wants you to come to Him and He wants you to receive the forgiveness that He already paid for. All you need to do is receive Him. All you need to do is put your faith in Him. So if that is you today, and you say, Dave, I wanna be made right with God. 
I know that there are things in my life that in my own heart that are unjust and wicked, where there should be righteousness and good things in my, good judgment in my heart, there, even there, I find wickedness. And you say, I need to be made right with God. I know this God that you talk about is a just God and that He loves me and He wants to provide a way out of my sin and my brokenness. If you say, that's what I wanna do this morning, I wanna be made right, can I ask you just right now, just to lift your hand nice and high and I just wanna pray for you and then I'm gonna give another call. I see that hand, is there anyone else? All across the city campus, online, uh, city campus, if that's you as well, you can just raise your hands. We have leaders there who are looking out. They would love to be able to pray with you after this as well. One last opportunity to be made right with God. Come on, let's pray. I see that hand. All right, church, would you pray along with me? Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that you are a righteous God. And I know that we have been separated by my sin. I believe in what you did for me at the cross. I believe that Jesus Christ died. I believe that he rose again to take the punishment for my sin and to restore me to right relationship with my creator. Lord, from this moment on, I give my life to you. I choose to follow you. I choose to live in relationship with you. Come into my life. Show me who you are. Let me be yours forever. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have prayed that for the very first time, if you have made that decision to be made into right relationship with God, I just wanna say that you have made the very, very best decision of your life. The very best decision of your life. Church, can we give a round of applause to those who have made that decision? You know, after this service, we're gonna have um, leaders in the Connect Lounge, the Connect Corner at the city campus who, who would love to be able to meet with you and talk you through the decision that you made. But right now, I, I wanna give a call for people here who are going through injustice in their life. That when I say life feels and seems unfair, you resonate with that in your heart. You're going through a situation, maybe you've lost your job, maybe you've got some broken relationship in your life and you need to come back to God and you need to entrust your life back to God and say, God, take control. You need to come back to the comforter and find comfort in this time. If that is you, we would love to be another source of comfort for you as well. We would love to pray alongside with you. We have leaders who would love to come along, talk with you, see how we can help and serve you, pray along with you, and commit your situation to God and pray for God to break through on your behalf. And so if that is you, what we're gonna do right now is we're just gonna sing a song. And if that's you, I would encourage you to come down to the front and receive ministry from the Lord receive ministry and commit uh, this season of your life, this situation to God. And we'd love to pray alongside with you. And then we're gonna, we're gonna pray after we sing. So church, would you stand to your feet? Let's, let's worship the Lord together for a while. And if that is you, you need to receive comfort from the Lord. You're going through a hard time and you need, you need God in this situation. Would you just make your way to the front? We'd love to pray for you. Come on, let's sing.